Well, this next conversation is going to be fascinating. Please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Lynn Todman and Mary Pat Varga. Economic Vitality in Communications and Color is what they're going to be talking about, healing the trauma of racism. I'm moderated by Mary Pat Varga, and she is CEO of Varga and Associates. Uh, Dr. Lynn Todman is Executive Director of Population Health, Lakeland Health Systems. Please give them a hand. Thank you. This is super exciting to be here, so thank you. all. We're, we're really thrilled to be here, Lynn, and, yeah. and this is an honor for me. Um, you and I have collaborated for many years together on a variety of projects, and I know, Lynn, you've been so invested in social justice initiatives, but what I'm really excited for us to talk about today is your latest project as Executive Director of Population Health for Lakeland Health. Um, you're doing something called Community Grand Rounds, which takes a deep dive and look at how the toxic stress of racism impacts health. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it, you've got this interesting laboratory um, because this is all taking place in Southwest Michigan. There are two cities, Benton Harbor, which is poor and primarily African-American. And then on the other side of the river, there's St. Joe's, which is affluent and primarily white. And so in your role at Lakeland, you've started exploring the health outcomes of these two very different communities. And what you've often said is, Mary Pat, racism makes people sick. So I want to ask you, what do you mean by that? Right. Thank you, Mary Pat. Um, let me just back up a moment and tell you how I got mm -hmm. to that point. So part of my job is to assess community health needs. And one of the things that I, I identified very early on, when I mapped mortality rates across the county, I found that half of the really high mortality census tracts were majority African American. And yet African Americans are only 15% of the county population. So from the perspective of a health system person that needed to make a case for focusing on low-income African-American communities for help, this was rich information. The other thing I heard when I was doing this assessment was that mental health was a big issue. People talked about anxiety, depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, all kinds of mental health issues. And laced in between their comments were um, phrases that evoked notions of trauma chronic poverty, homelessness, hunger, incarceration, uh, substance misuse, um, all kinds of traumas that were happening. So I put all this together and I started doing some investigations about the impact of trauma on health. And it turns out that racism stimulates the same processes, the experience of racism or even the threat of the experience of racism stimulates the same physiological processes in the body as other traumas. So that, that's how I started this. And, and in the, those two communities, what did you find were the differences in health outcomes? Well, I mean, in the low-income African-American communities, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers, um, kind of the range of issues um, were, were more salient, more problematic in the low-income African-American communities than in the white community. And I know we've got this infographic that um, maybe the audience can take a look at that really does talk about the toxic stress of, of racism. Is there anything, Lynn, that you want to add to what yeah. we're taking a look at here? What I would say is that when racism is a factor undermining employment, um, when it contributes to food insecurity, homelessness, um, when, it, when racism is uh, a, a reason why your neighborhood isn't safe, those stressors that are racism driven stimulate, as I said, the same biological processes in the body as other forms of, of trauma. So the up, what we say is the upregulation of inflammatory processes in the body, inflammation is implicated in all kinds of diseases the suppression of the immune system in the body, and then you have these outcomes, hypertension, um, sh sugar issues, 
uh, fertility issues, depression, all kinds of diseases that are, that are associated with inflammation and the depressed immune system become present when people experience this chronic drip drop of racist experiences day in, day out, year after year. Wow, and what can you tell us, Lynn, about the evidence that you're finding that, that solidifies this link? Right. So the evidence is growing, and it's becoming more robust, scientific. Um, there's this whole body of knowledge, adverse childhood experiences that is incubating up to the top where uh, we're making these uh, linkages between trauma in childhood and later life, uh, mental health, behavioral health issues, um, and physical health issues later in life. Early childhood trauma actually has a strong association with shortening one's life for up to 20 years. Wow. So, so there's that body of work. There's the work coming out um, in psychology and psychiatry that's linking what's happening to the brain, to the central nervous system, and then through the rest of the body. There's the literature in epigenetics that is showing how the environment that we live in can actually change the way our genes are expressed and predispose us to disease. Um, there's the social genomics literature, again, where what you see, what you process in your social environment gets embedded in your body, in your organs, and causes and is associated with an onset and progression of disease. So the literature is really becoming more robust. Um, some, just some examples of things I've seen in recent, just in recent weeks is analysis of maternal outcomes pre and post Jim Crow. You know, so we have enough historical data to show that Jim Crow had a negative impact on maternal outcomes. Uh, we're hearing, and some of you are familiar with the concept of John Henryism, this constant striving, this uphill striving that black folks and people of color have to go through to navigate the workplace, the housing market, and whatever, to the point that you just drop dead. I mean, there's, so there's a lot of research, and we've always understood that, that you know, racism and health, there was a connection. But what's new now is we understand the biology underlying that con connection, the physiological changes in the body that, um, that mediate that connection between the two. You told me about a, um, a Yale University 40th year anniversary that makes this point really well right. when you talk about John Henryism. Can you talk about that? Yeah, one? so uh, um, a gentleman who graduated from Yale, an African American who graduated from Yale in 1970, one of the first classes, if not the first class of African American men to go to Yale, went to his 40th reunion recently. And at one point, they have basically a list of people who had expired or died uh, since graduation. And he did a count and noted that 15% of the people who died were African American men, but African American men comprised only about 3% of that graduating class. And these are men who went on to do, you know, professionally be very successful. They went on to be, you know, business people, lawyers, uh, physicians. But none of that, none of their education, their housing, their great health insurance protected them or protected their bodies from the chronic stress of experiencing racism, racist experiences every step of the way of their journey, their professional journey. So there are lots of anecdotes like that, but the point that, that I really wanna to leave today with is that the science is now backing up what we have intuitively known for a long, long time. I was gonna say, because I think there's many people in this audience that would not be surprised at all about this link between racism and health. But I'm wondering too, uh, beyond the science, why do you think it's now reaching a larger audience and getting broader acceptance? Because I feel like every time I watch a new TED talk, you know, it, it, it relates to this, or NPR is doing stories on, on this linkage. Mm -hmm. um, beyond the science, why is it suddenly now Right. Getting traction. Well, I think we live in a toxic time. Mm -hmm. I think um, African Americans and people of color are trying to navigate national narratives that are actually very hurtful, very painful, and we're actually feeling it in our bodies. And so I think that's, that's part of it. The science is part of it, but then the timeliness of the science and what we're trying to kind of manage on day to day through the news feeds, through comments made by people in the workplace or in our neighborhoods or police officers, there's kind of like this emboldenedness, this um, uh, 
freedom to say and do things that maybe five years ago would have been deemed inappropriate and held back, but now we're more vulnerable to it now. Mm -hmm. You know, you, um, you've been holding some focus groups in your home with members of the African American community, and you told a story about a gentleman um, mm -hmm. checking his Fitbit. Right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we were talking about what it's like to be African American in this part of the country where it's, it's it's right-leaning, I think that's the best way to say it, and what it's like to be in this community. And he said, you know, I go through my day and, you know, I hear that comment, I see that action, I brush it off, I move on, I get through my day and I think I'm okay, you know, I can, I can tune this stuff out. He said, but when I go home at night and I start processing what I heard and what I saw, and I'm trying to figure out, well, was it really what I thought it was, or was it this, or what they were trying to do? And then I look at my Fitbit, and my heart rate is just bumping, and I know this is killing me, is what he said to me. I know this is killing me, and I know this is shortening my life. And I just thought that was a really powerful, visceral example of, you think you're okay, you know, because you're, you're managing through it, but your body is keeping the count. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. Your body is keeping the count. Mm -hmm. Do you, Lynn, is there a story you can share with us, any direct experience from your own life that, uh, that yeah. would help address this? Yeah, so I'm sure many people in this audience can share such experiences, but one that stands out in my mind is um, my son, who, um, like young people, uh, decided to drive to another city late in the evening. I would have preferred that he left early in the day, but he made these decisions. In any case, at 11 o'clock at night, I get a phone call from him, and he said, Mom, I'm on the highway, it's dark, and a police car just drove up behind me. I'm going to put my cell phone on the car seat next to me so you can hear the conversation, and in case things don't go well, you have something to work with. So you can imagine, oops, <laughs> exactly. I'm just like, okay. You know, and this is in, a bo in the backdrop of a, a, a country and a time where things are happening to young African American men by police with impunity. Um, and I heard the exchange, the exchange was fine, um, but then because of the work that I do, I started reflecting the next morning kind of what was going on with my body as I was on the phone with him and hoping that I didn't hear anything that would cause my heart to sink into my stomach. And I thought, what was his body stress response doing at the same time? What, was, what were the levels of cortisol and adrenaline in his body, which we know are toxic at certain levels? What were they doing? And then what does it do to your body when you have to navigate life all the time with those considerations? And so that's just one example, mm -hmm. but as I said, I'm sure many people in this audience, and I, I think it's really important to know that we all have stress, mm -hmm. and stress and the cortisol and adrenaline that's produced in our bodies as a result of that is at some level protective. Mm -hmm. That's how we survive as a species. But when it's unrelenting, when it doesn't stop, that's when it gets toxic. And as a mother, we all as parents worry about our children. But African American parents, Latino parents, we have that layer, that extra layer of stress that we live with every day, and I think that's reflected in the mortality rates, you know, yeah. the differential disease, incidence of disease. There are other factors too, but this is a factor, racism-related stress, that I don't think clinicians, as a rule, consider. And Lynn, I know that you have a background um, as an urban planner, and I'm wondering, what that pathway, how that pathway led you to this right. work? Yeah, so it was a long path, but um, probably a watershed moment. I'm from Chicago, I'm from the south side of Chicago, and I left the city in the mid-70s when Chicago was kind of like on a down slope, but came back in the 90s, and I was really impressed by what, those of you who are from Chicago, been to Chicago, the downtown and near north areas look really wonderful. So one morning I thought, I was visiting the city. Um, I'm going to drive down Stony Island, down some of those south side African-American communities that I knew growing up. And 
I remember this, this kind of sinking gut in my feeling as I saw, you know, boarded up buildings and people hanging out on the street at 10 o'clock in the morning, which basically spoke to a lot of unemployment, trash, liquor stores, fast food places. And I, I, this was not the South Side that I left. It was never, a, you know, an affluent um, area, but it had a sense of hope and promise and potential. And as I'm uh, pondering this, I come to a stoplight and I, I see movement out the side of my eye and I turn just in time to watch a woman pull her pants down to her ankles, squat and urinate on the street. Now, I had never seen anything like that and I thought, what is wrong with that woman? And then a couple years later, I went to work with psychologists in Chicago. My job was to help them to understand how the, envi the urban environment can actually impact psychological functioning. Where you live, what you experience, where you worship, where you go to school, these things can actually impact the brain. And I remember as I'm trying to get them to understand that, the light bulb went off and I realized that that woman that I saw, I was asking the wrong question that day. What is wrong with her? And this really impacted the, the trajectory of my work. I should have asked, does she have a place to live? Is there anyone that loves her? Is missing her now? Does she have food? I was asking completely the wrong questions. And that has actually led me to this work because as I work with physicians now in a hospital, they go to that previous question. When I bring to them the data, black folks in this community are dying at rates that are twice the county average and twice the national average. The response is, well, if they would just eat right, they would just exercise more. And while that is a component of it, those health behaviors are often coping strategies for a toxic environment that's laced with racism. So I think that was really pivotal for me to kind of change the frame on which I saw that woman. And I'm trying to get physicians that I work with to change the frame on which they see these communities that have these awful, awful health outcomes. I think that's so powerful to think about asking a different question because I think we can all relate to just wanting to say, what's wrong mm -hmm. with that person? Um, and stepping back, and I know you've talked about some of the physicians that you work with starting to ask slightly different questions. Mm -hmm. So rather than pinpointing a symptom and diagnosing, mm -hmm. they're asking questions more like, what was your childhood like? That's what we're trying to get them to do. Um, like, what, what's going on in your life? Like, what is the context that you're in? Um, we're at very early stages of that because when physicians ask that question, they also need to have resources to respond to them. And so we're actually in the point of trying to put together, you know, once a, a physician finds out that somebody is food insecure or they're going home to a betterer or, a, you know, a child has been incarcerated, we need some kind of path forward for, for the individual. And that's, in our community, what we're trying to craft, you know, trying to pull together the resources to support those underlying needs. And I know part of your, your mission is, again, I, I'm, I'm using this area of Southwest Michigan mm -hmm. to talk, it's like a laboratory, mm -hmm. and could it potentially be a model for the rest of the country to actually create healing environments for communities of color? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seems, Lynn, like such a big problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any framework you can share with us that might lead us to a solution. What can we do? Mm. Well, I have, um, I have backed into a framework that I use. Um, one is just reframing the problem, which is what I did with that woman. The problem wasn't her. The problem was the context she was in. And once you reframe that problem, then you have to basically figure out where, wh where the pathology actually belongs, kind of like relocate the pathology. So when I first looked at that woman, I thought the pathology lied in her. But the, actually the pathology lied in the, the structures around her, you know, kind of what she's embedded in, the social stuff that she was embedded in. And once you kind of realize that you have to redirect your understanding of what the pathology is, you have to kind of 
rethink responsibility. So if it's not her fault, or her, not entirely, I mean, I think there's a place for personal responsibility, but in my mind, we have to start thinking more collectively about social responsibility. What is my responsibility to that woman on the street? What role can I play in, in, in helping her um, not be in a place where she felt compelled to urinate on the street? And then the last is, you know, and, and none of this is rocket science, but it's hard work is kind of re reform the systems that we're embedded in. In the community that I'm working in, it's law enforcement, it's the education system, I'm working as hard as I can within the health system, I'm collaborating with folks in transportation, and housing, and economic development, to create supportive systems, and even just to get people to talk about being anti-racist. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think the antidote or the solution is going to be very context specific, um, but that's what we're doing in, in our environment. And we were talking earlier about you know all the wonderful speakers that we've heard at this conference. It, it, it feels like little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle where we're putting all of those together to, you know, because one of the things that's so clear in what you're saying, if people are ill. Mm -hmm. um, they're really not going to be able to add value to the economic vitality of the communities that they live in. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge part of the work that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that's really clear in the literature is that when you're exposed to toxic levels of stress, it actually, imp especially young people, when the brain is developing, it impacts some basic capacity for skill development, so cognitive impairments, executive functioning, that like complex analytic thinking, abstract thinking, picking up on social cues, all that stuff is affected by toxic levels of stress when you're young. Now you can imagine what that means for your ability to succeed in school. You can imagine what that means for your ability to interact with uh, other people. So that's just one part of the puzzle. Then if you got move from the brain down to the rest of the body, if you're, if you're sick, um, it's going to compromise your ability to contribute, to be innovative, um, to be productive, to be able to contribute to the economic vitality of communities. And I remember having conversations with our economic development, uh, the person who runs our economic development agency, and he thought, we're going to bring jobs, we're going to bring jobs in. And I thought, you know, Jeff, that's great, but are the people equipped um, to actually take the jobs? And ultimately, it wasn't entirely clear that they were. There were lots of issues that compromised their capacity to do that, and health is one of them. So. Really important. Um, Lynn, as we wrap up here, I'm wondering, um, is there a final call to action that, mm -hmm. that you've got for us? Because this is not easy, what you're describing, even talking about racism in this way. I mean, you, you've run into this a lot in, mm -hmm. in the hospital. There's a, an initial resistance mm -hmm. to that's not really what the problem is. Um, but what do you want to leave us with? Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can leave you with what I think um, is appropriate. And again, it's asking the right questions. So the questions I'm asking in my community is, is the health system that I'm working for inclusive, authentically inclusive? Um, does it engender a sense of belonging? Um, does it value everything that we all bring to the table? Does the community I live in, is that inclusive? Um, does it engender a sense of cohesion and connectedness? And I think that is one step toward, that's one thing that I think we can start asking about our own organizations. I think in many organizations we talk about diversity and inclusion, but that's about it. It's not really an authentic agenda item. So I think, you know, on the path to becoming an anti-racist organization, I think one of the early steps is are we actually as inclusive as we say we are? And you, you've said you are one of those people, as you walk around your hospital environment, you're persistent, you're asking the questions, right. and it does take that sort of tenacity to move this forward. Yeah, it, it actually takes being willing to be showed to the door. There you go. <laughs> Lynn's always said, it's like, I'm going to do this until they kick me out. Right. So. Thank you, Lynn, so much, thank and thank, all, thank, you. thank you all for listening and, and being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.